Well, good morning, church family. What an incredible day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? All right, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. As we continue our walk through the book of 1 Timothy, we've been walking through it all fall. Um, So you hold your spot there. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. And as Harper gave in her testimony this morning, you can take that Bible and keep it as a gift from us to you so that you can have a copy of God's word. Take it, okay? Please do that. Now, all right, so before we jump back into our context of of where we've been in 1 Timothy, because remember, uh, Timothy has been left in the church in Ephesus, okay? Okay. I want to describe kind of a sister situation of what happened at the same time in the churches in Crete. So if you go back to Pentecost when Peter stood up and addresses thousands that were visiting Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the church and stirred up everyone, and Peter is now able to address thousands. What did Peter do? He preached the gospel. Repent and believe. Place your faith in Jesus. You too can be saved. Now, Acts 2.11 tells us that of the thousands that were saved, some of those were from the island of Crete. Now, who presumably after Pentecost went back home and told the good news of Jesus to their friends and their families and their neighbors And the gospel spread, and churches were planted. Now, it's easy for us to gloss over what I just said, but I want you to stop and and meditate. Think about the magnificence of this. The Holy Spirit of God now fills his people. We are the church wherever we meet, even in homes in Crete. And everyone is qualified to evangelize, to tell your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, Right, A special leader like Peter didn't go back with them. No, they were just ordinary people, just like you and me. And as the New Testament teaches, everyone is also a priest. Everyone has access to Jesus. You don't have to go through the Levitical priesthood anymore. Every individual has access to God, to learn, to pray, to teach one another, to invest in each other's lives, that each of us is led by the Holy Spirit and we are knit together into the body of Christ. Now, Paul had never been to Crete. And as far as we know, no other leader had ever been there. And it had been almost 25 years since Pentecost when Paul landed on the island due to a storm. Now, While he was on the island, what sort of state do you think he found the church in? It was actually chaotic, unorganized, false teachers, weak leadership. They looked almost exactly just like the culture. So the first opportunity that Paul got, he returned to Crete with Titus and and instituted an intense operation that I would call appoint godly men as elders and charge them to teach the scripture and begin to lead with strength. You see, for all the amazing components of the church, God still designed leadership as a major component within For as leadership goes, so goes the church. Or again, leadership is the soil in which the church grows. Now with that, I want us to read our text this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read the first seven verses. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work that he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, 
not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as as we have gathered together this morning as your people, first, Father, we are overwhelmed with the good news of the gospel that has been put on display this morning through, through baptism and through our worship. Father, the fact that you meet with us and you inhabit the praises of your people is a magnificent truth. We thank you for that. Father, now as we, as we examine this, this thing called the local church that you set up, Father, we pray for wisdom to be able to learn from you, to be able to, to care deeply about the church, about its, its structure, and all that that means for us as your people who long to see your light shine into the darkness and for us to reach our culture around us with the hope of Jesus. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want us to remember now again our context in the book of 1 Timothy uh, in the church of Ephesus. Paul had spent three years in Ephesus following one of the greatest revivals in in all of history. Ephesus has thousands of Christians, many churches that are spread throughout the city, meeting in homes and in other large gathering spaces. Now Paul, while he was there, he helped set up elders, or what we call pastors, in each church during his stay. But eventually God called Paul to move on. And Paul knew before long that after his departure, that the void, that his strong leadership, that false teachers would rise up and cause major divisions. In fact, in fact Paul warned specifically of this in Acts chapter 20. Well, guess what? That's exactly what happened. False teachers rose up. Many of them probably elders now in the various churches. And as we've seen, they've been teaching an inward gospel, focusing on fringe mystical ideas with legalistic rules, and began to cause major divisions and constant friction within the church. So it should be no surprise that now Paul focuses on the character associated with the leaders of the church. It is a trustworthy statement. I want to show you the structure of this letter, 1 Timothy, and how the whole thing is fit together. There are three trustworthy statements that function as the headings or the three major movements within this letter. The first one, Mark covered for us way back in chapter 1, verse 15. And it reads, it is a trustworthy statement (coughs) deserving full acceptance (coughs) that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You remember that? (coughs) So the first third of the letter has this gospel emphasis, correcting the false teacher's inward gospel, right? No, God desires all to come to salvation. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. And Paul pressured the church. He urged the church. He pressed that we must pray for the lost. Well, now we get to the second trustworthy statement. And the focus now shifts to godly leadership within the church. 
But I want to take just a moment and to connect those two trustworthy statements. See, the church must have a passion to reach the lost, to pray for the lost, to compel the lost. Come and see, come and hear the good news of Jesus. But the church cannot accomplish its mission unless the church is healthy and stable, unless the church has godly leadership, and unless the house is in order. You see, it is not good to say, come to Jesus, and then when the seeker comes to the church, they find that the people of God are a dysfunctional family, right? When, when, when people are tired of the empty lies of culture, when they hunger for truth, where can they turn? Well, the answer must be the church. And the church must glorify the truth of Jesus by its health. And that begins with leadership. Verse one, it is a trustworthy statement if a man aspires to the office of overseer. Have you given much thought to the structure that God has given for the church, his body. Previous generations fought and even died upon this hill. There are two offices that scripture sets up for the New Testament church, overseer and deacon. We will cover deacon next week. The titles elder, overseer and pastor are used interchangeably in the New Testament for this first position. The most common term is elder, and that was actually used in the Old Testament and in Jewish culture for the wise leader of the clan or a city, right? Because with age comes wisdom. The word overseer is the the Greek word episkopos, And that means one who watches over. Now, you didn't need me to tell you that. That's pretty common sense. And this overseer refers to the governing leadership given to the position. And the word pastor is the Latin word for shepherd, referring to the function to be a shepherd like Jesus is a shepherd. That is caring, leading, and teaching the sheep. Now, the two main uh, purposes, the two main functions of the office are to lead and feed. The overseers are responsible for teaching and governing the congregation. As leaders, they give guidance and direction to the church. And as teachers, they oversee the life of the church and preserve biblical, faithful teaching. First, Paul will say later in this letter, 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. <clears throat> As Paul says here, the desire for the position is a good thing. It is a worthy pursuit to pursue one's life and energy and talents leading the local church. In fact, we need more qualified, godly men who are willing to lead local churches. And I want to point out that nothing that I am about to say requires that an overseer get paid or go to seminary. Many churches have lay elders, all right, that is not professionals, and that is a very biblical model. Now, I want to say a few important things for clarity. Number one, always remember, Jesus is the head of the church, okay? The local church is his body, and he is the head. Obedience and faithfulness to him is always the aim. Number two, the Bible gives final authority to the congregation as a whole, okay? That is, the congregation has the ability to say 
What is the authentic gospel? That's why your participation in baptism this morning and that we are saying, yes, that is the gospel. And the church actually has the authority to say who is in the kingdom and who is out of the kingdom, okay? And this authority is given to the congregation as a whole, not to a board of elders or the deacons or any other leadership group. The final authority rests with the congregation. But, number three, the church is still to call and set aside overseers. And then they are told to obey and honor and submit to pastors, teaching, and governance. Now, you may say, well, that sounds like a contradiction. Okay, how, come it, how could it be that the church has the final authority, and yet the church is also supposed to submit to the authority of the overseers. Well, it's not a contradiction, it's checks and balances, okay? It's priesthood of the believer and submit to godly authority. So think with me real quick in the positive sense about how this is supposed to work, that the church appoints overseers who are called to lead with gentleness and patience persuading the people of God with the word of God. Do you know that that is the major tool that I have is to persuade you with God's word, okay? And the church submits, follows willingly, and allows the overseers to lead. That is a picture of health. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give an account, an account before God on that final day. But now consider the negative sense. You have an overseer who has moral failure or is leading in a harsh, domineering spirit or they're teaching false doctrine, distorting the gospel. Now, ultimately, The congregation is responsible for holding them accountable. Before God, you are responsible. Now, sure, the conversations start in small circles of leadership, probably even amongst the overseers themselves. But the final authority is ultimately given to the congregation as a whole. I read an article just this week in Christianity Today that highlighted that in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, over this summer, at least eight megachurch pastors stepped down over moral failings, mostly sexual in nature. Eight, just over the summer, just in DFW. Those Uh, Those leaders oversee at least 50,000 churchgoers. And the article detailed how confused and hurt and angry those left in the wake felt. You see, our Christian culture has chosen talent over character. In its leaders, we we will choose talent over character. And as a people, we have chosen entertainment over commitment to a local church. How can we hold up truth to the culture if this is our dysfunctional house? Beloved, it would serve us well to deeply consider God's instructions for the church and what this is supposed to look like. And church, wouldn't you agree that if you are called to obey and submit to leadership, that we ought to take a long, hard look at character and let's do it on the front end. Because it gets so messy when you do it on the back end. And as our text shows, Satan's attacks are enough 
We certainly don't want men who do not have the character to begin with. So look again at our text. In verses 2 and in verse 7, that Paul brackets, an overseer then must be above reproach. And then in verse 7, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church. Okay? He begins and ends with this over Uh, arching general statement that church character matters one's reputation matters within and outside the church especially for leaders overseers must be blameless in their outward observable conduct free from scandalous sin and not that any man can be sinless or perfect, but certainly the standard is high moral character. Now allow me to come back in a moment and address marriage and the household together as a unit. Next, the next several list of qualifications have to do with self-mastery over the flesh, temperate, prudent, respectable. Now, the ESV uses uh, some more everyday words, and it says sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable. Now, all three of these ideas revolve around the idea of order and balance within the Christian life, avoiding excess, even of good things, because godly priorities must stay in balance so that the overseer can exercise sound judgment because he is free from rashness and able to control his appetites, clearly seeing the kingdom priorities over fleshly priorities. So I have a group of Aggie pastors that we all went to the same church in college. And uh, when we became senior pastors, uh, a cohort was formed so that we could get together and kind of discuss church issues and things that go on. Now, there are a few of those guys that are in that group that are a little older, and I call them from time to time and beg for their godly wisdom, right? When situations get pretty intense or confusing and I need some clarity, some help, some thought, because I know they have this sort of character, sober-minded, self-control, sound judgment, and they are able to give me clear advice. Now, beloved, I pray that you find these same characteristics in me and in all of our pastors. Now, in contrast, verse 3 lists three things that must not be in his character, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle and peaceable, free from the love of money. So let's be honest. There are, are sometimes men gravitate towards positions of leadership for the wrong reasons, right? For the power, for control, for delusions of self-grandeur. And they do not have the character to lead Christ's bride, not addicted to wine. The literal translation here is one who stands near wine, meaning that he cannot be far from it. But we must not limit this simply to alcohol. An overseer must not be over-dependent on any substance. Pugnacious means to not be quarrelsome or contentious. Someone who is always fighting. Now, this doesn't just mean physically, but certainly it does. Someone who is pugnacious is quick-tempered, allowing his emotions to get the best of him, and therefore, he is also slow to listen. This is a direct charge in this passage against the false teachers and the sort of leadership that had risen up there in Ephesus, okay, and was causing divisions amongst the church. Later, Paul will say, there is constant friction among you because of this. Now, the third thing that Paul lists that the overseer's character must be free from is the love of money. Because 
One cannot pursue money above God, above what is best for the church. As Jesus said, one cannot serve God and money. This too is a direct charge against the false teachers who simply want to get rich. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is in Ezekiel chapter 34. And it's one of my favorite because it, it is very convicting, especially for, for leadership. It is a lament, and God is taking aim at the leaders in Israel, those who are shepherding in Israel. God says, when I look down from heaven and I look and I see the shepherds, the shepherds of Israel are, are not seeking the lost. They are not tending to the sheep. They are not feeding them. They are not binding them up and healing them. They are not concerned about the sheep at all. Rather, they are simply feeding off of the sheep. They are selfishly slaughtering the fatted lambs and clothing themselves, and they have no concern for my sheep. And God is furious. And so God says, since you won't do it, since I don't have leaders that do it, I will come down, and I will search for my sheep, and I will find them, and I will deliver them, and I will bind them, and I will heal them, and I will feed them, and I will care for them, and I will protect them. And 14 times in that passage, God says, I will come down, and I will do it. And then he ends it by saying, I will send my servant David to be their shepherd in reference to Jesus, God's son. Amen. What I love about that picture, that powerful call, what is unmistakable is God's own heart for his people, right? God's tender loving heart for his people. When are his people going to be cared for? And then the desperate need and call that it is for pastors of the church to follow Jesus' example and to put God's people first and to not be like the sinful leaders of Israel who were completely self-serving. Now we've got time to highlight uh, one more emphasis that Paul gives towards the overseer, and that is the minister's home. Verses four and five. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? You see, the principle is simple, really. How can a man be expected to lead the family of God unless he has first proven that he can lead his wife and his children well. In part, this is a reminder for us that a, fast, a pastor's first priority is to his own family. Before the church, and the congregation should champion and support this, themselves bringing caution that the minister should not burn out for the church while his bride and children suffer. A pastor friend told me this week, they will applaud you all the way into a brick wall. An overseer must be an example of one who lays down his life for his wife and loves her the way that Christ does the church. And one who leads and disciples and disciplines his own children in godliness, being careful not to provoke them to anger by being overly harsh. You see, the wisdom of being patient and understanding and leading within the home is all essential for being patient and understanding and leading within the church. Now, certainly the church must not be too harsh in examining the children knowing that every child makes mistakes and causes their parents heartache. So the key here is that children are respectful to authority. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Paul began with an overall statement about the overseer's character. 
He must have a good reputation. Then he ends with that same. He must have a good reputation within and without the church as a man of character because character matters. Above talent, above charisma, and being clever and funny, character matters. As we look at the landscape of Christianity across our nation, and we hear story after story of pastors who are caught in sexual sin or removed because of harsh, harsh, abusive leadership or caught with their hand in the money jar, we say, oh, how the name of Christ has been tarnished due to the lack of character in our leaders and our craving for entertainment rather than faithfully being committed to God's instructions. Beloved, if if we're going to hold up truth to culture, we can't be a hot mess in here. When I was little, all I ever wanted to become was was an athlete, right? Was, was a professional athlete. So you could find me in the backyard imitating all sorts of sports heroes, right? So you, you could find me I, I, uh, in the backyard after, after Michael Jordan did that incredible move where he went up on this side and he quickly turned around. So you could find me in the backyard with about a, uh, about a four-inch vertical trying to do that really quick, just over and over. But now that I'm about halfway grown, you know who I want to imitate? His name is Chris Osborne, and he was my pastor in college. I even stopped growing hair so that I could be just like him. (laughs) Now, I was saved in high school, but... I never had anyone to disciple me. And so when I got to college, I, I was uh, considerably a mess in my Christian walk. You had, you had every right to question whether I was genuinely saved and genuinely a Christian. But I began attending this church. And through Chris's leadership and clarity of Bible teaching, the Spirit of God just began to grab a hold of me. And then I I found out that he began to offer a a Tuesday morning discipleship class that was at 6 a.m. Now, I was one of those college students that did not uh, schedule any classes before about 10.30. I worked very hard to get my schedule. I took no 8 o'clocks. But every Tuesday morning, I got up at 6 a.m. to go meet with Chris and a group of, of college students, and he would introduce different, different books and teachings to us. And I was soaking it in. And while I was there, the closer that I got, I got to see his character, that he genuinely loved Jesus and the church. And he loved his wife and his kids, and he stood on principle, regardless of culture's shifts. Now, after the Lord ended up calling me into ministry years later, Chris was the one who had started this network of of, uh, pastors that had come through his church. And we kind of gathered like a cohort and we're able to meet together and just talk about issues that happen within the church and things that, that get confusing, right? And to have people that would check on you and pray for you. We could talk about the loneliness of, of leadership and all that takes place. Chris spent 30 plus years in one church and was a model of faithful, godly character. This morning I would tell you, the church needs a generation of Chris Osborne's. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we have come to your word this morning and as we have thought 
critically and well, intently, about leadership within the local church and its importance. It's importance for the, the whole congregation to examine who we are as a people. Father, so that we can be healthy and so that we can shine your light to the lost culture, your light into darkness. Father, our own home must be in order. Church family, right now, I want you across this sanctuary, I want you to begin to specifically pray for, for me and your pastoral team that leads. I want you to notice in this text the way that this text ends with the fact that Satan loves to attack church's leadership. Would you pray for that? Would you pray for our marriages? Would you pray for our children? Would you pray that the Lord would give you a willing spirit to follow and to submit where it is appropriate and to trust where it's appropriate? Would you pray that the Lord would give you discernment for when to rise up in correction for how to see warning signs early in the life of the leadership and that First Baptist would be a healthy, healthy church for the glory of Jesus' name. It's in his name we pray, amen. Church family, the praise team's gonna come and lead us in one final song, and it is always an opportunity for us to respond. However, the Spirit of God has spoken to you throughout the service, whether it was through the baptisms, whether it's through his word, whether it's through the singing, this is an opportunity for you to respond. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you came in with a burden, do not leave carrying that burden on your own. Share it with a brother or sister so that we can pray together. Whatever God's spirit has spoken, you be obedient and respond. Would you stand?